Join us as we go in search of history to unravel the legend and legacy of Mr. Ponzi and his scheme. From lotteries to land deals to Las Vegas, people have always yearned for a way to obtain instant wealth. The beguiling notion of easy money often appeals to the darker side of human nature, when powerful thoughts of greed and avarice overwhelm those of reason and restraint. Six, in Parma, Italy, in 1882, a boy was born who would grow up to leave his mark in the realm of get-rich-quick schemes, Charles Ponzi. Although accounts of his youth remain sketchy, it appeared that Ponzi always had his eye on money. One thing we do know is that from very early age, Charles Ponzi was a very uh, established thief. He stole petty things, uh, church poor boxes, uh, documents, anything he could get his hands on. And he wasn't very good at it because he always got caught. And as a matter of fact, after a time, his family, tired and endlessly bailing him out, decided they'd had enough of him. And very frankly, they just simply deported him. With $200 in his pocket, Ponzi sailed to the United States in 1903 aboard the SS Vancouver. Like many immigrants, he saw the United States as a beacon of shining light that could fulfill his dreams of wealth and fame. But first, Ponzi had some onboard business to transact. He presumed, because he had learned some card sharpening skills, that he could take his fortune of $200 and perhaps parlay it into a greater amount of money. Unfortunately, there were some substantially more experienced individuals on the board, and when he finally landed, he had about the equivalent of $2.50 US, which was not a lot to make a good start in New York City. Ponzi, armed with a winning smile and infectious confidence, quickly learned to read and speak English. He tried his hand at a variety of entry-level jobs. He went to work as a dishwasher. He slept in the kitchen, apparently, at the restaurant where he worked. He bought a suit and became a waiter in the restaurant. He was doing very well. Ponzi's climb up the ladder of success was brief. He was fired within a very short space of time because he was being accused on an ongoing basis of shortchanging the customers and of falsifying bills so that they had to let him go. Despite his early difficulties in the United States, Ponzi remained convinced he would one day amass a great fortune. In 1907, Ponzi moved to Montreal, Canada, landing a job at the tiny Zorosi Bank. The banking laws in Canada apparently were not terribly tight in those days, and if you had some money, you could open a bank. And because Ponzi was pretty good with numbers, he was hired to work as an assistant teller. Uh, the first thing that he found out by going through the books is that the bank had made some very bad real estate loans and was in great trouble. Charles Ponzi sensed that his hoped-for opportunity to get rich quick was at hand. With the help of an acquaintance, Ponzi developed a plan to take over the Zorosi Bank. Meanwhile, Ponzi was secretly depleting the account of an elderly bank customer by imitating her signature and cashing checks in her name. And the bank auditors were call called in, and within a day they had figured out all that has gone on in that account, and Charles Ponzi was arrested. And then he was sent to jail for forgery, and he served three years in a Canadian prison. Not wanting his family in Italy to learn the real story, the enterprising Ponzi wrote to his beloved mother that he had taken a job as special assistant to the prison warden for three years. When he got out of prison, he headed back to the United States. No point in coming into the United States empty-handed. He got involved in a scheme to smuggle Italian immigrants across the border from Canada to the United States. And he got caught. And he went to prison again. Charles Ponzi served a two-year term at a U.S. penitentiary in Georgia, 
his visions of wealth and fame seemingly far beyond his grasp. Upon his release in 1918, Ponzi made his way to Boston, Massachusetts, where he met and married Rose Nieco, also an Italian immigrant. In Boston, once again, he landed a job at a fairly low level in an organization with J.P. Poole, which is an importer and exporter in Boston. And he worked his way up. And really, who knows what might have happened if all of a sudden he hadn't had a correspondence with one particular Spaniard. And in the course of that correspondence, he discovered what his so-called grand scheme would be. It was a simple one-cent item that Ponzi saw as a million-dollar miracle, the Postal Reply Coupon. As America stood at the brink of the 1920s, it faced a time of great promise and wild financial speculation. Although prohibition had literally dampened spirits, the business world was booming, and there were untold riches waiting for those willing to take the risks. 1919, the United States felt full of itself. We had won the Great War. We had saved European civilization. America was confident, and the American working man felt that for the first time he was significantly participating in American success, in American growth. It was a big change. In Boston, Italian immigrant Charles Ponzi had been searching for his way to participate in America's success. In November of 1919, Ponzi, small in stature but big in dreams, determined that postal reply coupons could be his mother load. In 1907, an international postal congress had agreed to issue postal reply coupons throughout the world. The bearers could redeem these international coupons for postage stamps in their local country. This was to address a real problem. Immigrants who came to America could afford to buy stamps. The relatives who stayed home could not. So this was a way to allow relatives back home to write back to the family in America. Vice-like pressures of inflation and depression were ravaging post-World War I Europe but the U.S. dollar remained strong. Ponzi saw an opportunity with postal reply coupons that, properly exploited, could result in great wealth. Ponzi realized that if you went to a European post office with American dollars and bought postal reply coupons and then brought them to this country and cashed them in, you got U.S. postage many times more valuable than the U.S. money you spent for them. It was a legitimate opportunity of what we might call arbitrage. And this was the premise. Ponzi believed that for every dollar of postal reply coupons purchased, he could earn five dollars when he redeemed them for stamps. With a 400% profit from these initial purchases, Ponzi would buy additional coupons and redeem them for even more money. It seemed to be a proposition that couldn't lose. The ebullient Ponzi chatted up his convoluted idea to friends and associates in restaurants and clubs throughout Boston. He had this gift of gab, and he just had this overwhelming personality and the smile, smile at all times. No matter how bad things got, he had the smile. He seemed to glitter, he seemed to sparkle, he had, a, he had an immense air of supreme confidence about himself. He really thought he was very special, and it, it just shows. Ponzi offered anyone a cut of the action if they invested money with him. He promised investors a 50% return on their money in 45 days, or he would double their money in just three months. Ponzi assured them he was making a 400% profit on the purchase and redemption of postal reply coupons, so he could easily afford to pay out a phenomenal rate of return. In November of 1919, Charles Ponzi opened the Securities Exchange Company, or SEC, 
in a cramped and dingy office in downtown Boston. One of the people Ponzi became closely involved with was a furniture dealer named Daniels. When he opened his office, he had to have some furniture. Daniels gave him the furniture free of charge because Ponzi had no money to pay for it. A few risk takers took a gamble on Ponzi's deal. True to his word, Ponzi paid them their principal and interest as promised. I convince you somehow to give me a hundred dollars, telling you that in a short period of time I'll give you back two hundred, and when the time comes I do give you two hundred, you're going to do two things. First of all, you're going to tell everybody you know about it, and secondly, you're going to give me back the two hundred dollars. That's exactly what his investors did. Although word of this amazing offer spread quickly, Ponzi engaged sales agents, including his uncle, who also invested and paid them a 10% commission for every investor dollar they brought to the SEC. Ponzi himself would deal with the complexities of buying and selling postal reply coupons. All his investors had to do was hand over their money, and in exchange they would receive a note promising them a return of principal plus interest in 45 or 90 days. Ponzi couldn't print them quickly enough. By February of 1920, Ponzi's SEC had received $5,000. Ponzi happily accepted money from all comers, including $800 from his wife, Rose. By March, more than 100 people had invested almost $30,000. But Ponzi owed these investors more than $45,000 in principal and interest. Fortunately for Ponzi, when the notes came due, most depositors kept their money invested to accrue even more interest. At first, Ponzi's clients were mostly Italian immigrants, but as the good word spread, many others rapidly joined the growing crowds. There were policemen, there were priests, there were uh, various working people in Boston who thronged his offices to give him money. Mothers coming in with their children, older women who were mortgaging their homes to invest with Ponzi. And then it spread throughout New England with agents operating all across New England and even in New Jersey. The smooth and self-assured Ponzi had a ready answer for every doubt or question. The effervescent Italian was able to convince even the most skeptical investors with his snappy patter. Ponzi had not studied finance, but Ponzi had a bent for mathematics, and he had supreme confidence that if you throw enough numbers at people, their eyes will glaze over, and they will think you know what you're talking about. As torrents of money flowed daily into the coffers of the Security Exchange Company, Ponzi adjusted to his stunning success. He uh, greatly expanded his office. He hired people to uh, stand behind his telecages and take in the money. He hired managers. The money began flowing in at such a massive rate that he also hired Boston policemen to stand outside his business for $100. And every few minutes, one of the policemen would carry a satchel full of cash to the bank. By May of 1920, more than 1,000 investors had bought $422,000 worth of SEC notes. With this cash in hand, Ponzi launched his next scheme. What he did was that he began depositing these huge sums of money that were coming in in one particular bank in Boston, Hanover Trust. And his thinking was very simple. When I get enough of my own money deposited in that bank so that I am by far the majority depositor, I'll simply inform them that either they make me the head of the bank or I'll withdraw my deposits and the bank will collapse. Through these clever manipulations, Charles Ponzi received a controlling interest in the $5 million Hanover Trust Bank for less than $200,000. It was an astounding accomplishment for an ex-con who had been virtually penniless just six months earlier. Ponzi's young company had taken in three million dollars by July, but owed investors four and a half million. 
Charles Ponzi was succeeding beyond even his own wild dreams. But he stood at the top of a very dangerous pyramid. Every dollar made him richer and put him deeper into debt. And always he had this confidence that if he got enough money in the bank, he could buy the best lawyers, he could buy the best judges, and maybe he could use that money to invest in a real business that would get him out of the hole that the point of the pyramid was digging deeper and deeper every day. The sweltering Boston summer of 1920 was made even hotter thanks to Charles Ponzi and his grand financial wizardry. Immigrants joined their fellow Bostonians in ponying up millions of dollars to double their money within three months through Ponzi's postal reply coupon scheme. And there are all kinds of anecdotes about the woman in Quincy who mortgaged her home for $8,000 to invest everything with Ponzi and people who withdrew their money from banks to put everything with Ponzi. With income from his venture growing exponentially, Ponzi invested in the good life for himself. He bought a huge house outside of Boston and he put in, at that time, we're talking 1920, he put in central heat and air conditioning, a heated swimming pool, that was unheard of. He spent $500,000 alone on the furnishings for the home, which is a lot of money nowadays, but back then that was a tremendous amount of money. Ponzi brought his mother, Imelda, over from Italy via first-class ocean liner, donated $100,000 to a local orphanage, and hired publicity agent William McMasters to help with the onslaught of notoriety. Ponzi, out for revenge, even bought the pool shipping firm where he had once worked just so he could fire his former boss. But with every dollar Ponzi took in, the mountain of debt he owed his fanatical investors kept growing. The crowds outside Ponzi's School Street office caused curious officials to check things out. So three police officers came to Ponzi to find out whether he was legitimate or not. And after talking to him for a few minutes, two of the policemen decided to invest with Ponzi. And then it was estimated at the end that about a quarter of Boston's policemen were investing with Ponzi. Six months earlier, the diminutive Italian had been flat broke. Now, Charles Ponzi was basking in his newfound celebrity, swarmed by mobs of cheering fans wherever he went. In the Italian neighborhoods of Boston, he was a god. Ponzi was the image to them of, of everything they dreamed of. He had achieved this immense success. Not only that, they were all profiting immensely. Their money was being doubled. Somebody asked a member of the crowd about who was a very important person in America, and they answered Charles Ponzi. And he was there, and he said, well, what about Columbus? And they said, well, Columbus discovered America, but you're the man who invented money. And that was the way they felt about him. He was idolized. The first chink in Ponzi's financial armor arose when J.R. Daniels, the furniture dealer who had helped start Ponzi's business, came back into the picture. In the early summer of 1920, Daniels decided to sue Ponzi for one and a half million dollars because Daniels saw all of this money going into the Securities Exchange Company. He thought he was a partner. Ponzi owed him money, so he decided to sue. And this was part of the beginning of Ponzi's downfall when Daniels' suit brought attention to the fact that Ponzi was in this small office on rented furniture. How come he says he has all of these millions of dollars floating around? Although Daniel's claim was more sour grapes than a legitimate beef, an article about the suit published in the Boston Post brought a swift reaction. There was a run on Ponzi's Securities Exchange Company as some investors clamored for their money. 
One way Ponzi stopped the runs was by simply giving the money back. He could say, I can give away $200,000 a day and it doesn't hurt me. And this then would stop the run as people would say, look, he's giving the money back and more people would line up to try to invest. Both the commissioner of banks and the attorney general of Massachusetts had heard about Ponzi's company and sent some men to investigate. The Boston press also began to take an interest in the man people were calling a financial genius. One particular individual, Richard Grosier, the son of the publisher of the Boston Post, was perhaps a little more cynical than some, and he started asking a lot of questions. He sent out investigative reporters and said, no, this is too good to be true. Something is going on. And so he was really starting to ask a lot of questions. But on July 24th, 1920, a surprisingly positive Boston Post article profiled Ponzi and his money-making machine. As a result, hundreds of people jammed the offices of Ponzi's SEC to invest. Prior to the article's publication, the millions of dollars that flowed into Ponzi's waiting hands had derived solely from word of mouth. He was averaging, in a very short space of time, about $250,000 a day. And that is a lot of money when you put it in the context of the 1920s. Back then, a millionaire was somebody who was very, very rare. And so somebody who was receiving in $250,000 a day, that was a lot of money to be dealing with. The same day the Post article hit the stands, Ponzi met with government officials at the Massachusetts State House. After determining that his books were too convoluted to sort out, Ponzi offered them a plan. Well, Ponzi really had no books, but he said, I will volunteer to stop taking in money while you're doing the audit. I will continue to pay out money because I am so rich I can afford to do this but I won't take anything more if you think there's the slightest suspicious thing going on here. And they said, well, okay, that, that sounds all right to us. So they did not close him down immediately. In the meantime, Ponzi had been developing a new scheme that might free him from his looming predicament. He would convince his bankers to provide $10 million to purchase a fleet of merchant ships that were being sold by the U.S. government. Ponzi's plan was to transfer all of his company's assets and liabilities to the proposed steamship company, allowing his investors to trade in their investments for stock in the new company. Ponzi's plan failed to impress the bankers, and the scheme never materialized. By July 26th, the Boston Post had dug deeper into the dapper Italian's fuzzy financials, and ran the first in a series of negative articles about Charles Ponzi and his SEC. They contacted Clarence Barron. He was the Wall Street publisher that put, put out Barron's paper. And Barron wrote a, an article in which he said, if Ponzi can make 300% profit for his investors, why is he putting his money in banks that are only paying two or 3%? Why isn't he investing in his own company? Then the next issue had uh, Clarence Barron saying there's no possible way Ponzi's scheme could work. That in order for Ponzi to do this, there would have to be 160 million of these postal coupons circulating and there are only about 27,000 in the world. The post office also reported that there had been no large purchases of postal reply coupons either in the United States or overseas. The resulting panic caused a frantic run on Ponzi's security exchange company. When hundreds of people lined up to get their precious money back, a near riot ensued and a few women fainted. Nearly two million dollars were withdrawn from Ponzi's School Street office in less than three days. But the always positive Ponzi paid everyone back with a smile on his face. And Ponzi went out, this, this huge crowd of people, serving them coffee and donuts while they waited in line. He said, I can afford to do this. You have nothing to worry about. Some people turned away and said, all right, we'll leave our money in there. 
And this was going on while the auditors went on, you know, when we were doing their work. In response to the rising chorus of newspaper allegations, Ponzi was quoted as saying, I have just used this postal coupon idea as a blind. I didn't want the Wall Street boys to get even a hint of what my scheme is. As long as my depositors get their investments with profit, I don't have to account to anybody. Though Charles Ponzi maintained his exuberant demeanor, the noose seemed to be tightening. Ponzi's mother, interviewed by a local paper, said, Sometimes I think it is all a dream, and I wake up, and it will all be gone. In July of 1920, Boston was abuzz about Italian immigrant Charles Ponzi, who had attracted thousands of investors based on high interest rates and an international postal coupon scheme. But Ponzi's grand plans to create greater wealth for his investors and himself were stymied when government regulators, along with local newspapers like the Boston Post, began to poke holes in the twisted fabric of Ponzi's claims. On paper, you could prove that if you traded these postal reply coupons, you could make money. The only thing that you, you would have to factor into it would be that you would need to hire thousands of people to stand in line at post offices and buy the postal reply coupons. You would have to hire more people to bundle them up and ship them overseas. So on paper, yes, it looked fine but it was not a realistic plan. On the one hand, you can say he was a swindler and he knew all along he was taking people. On the other hand, perhaps he just was optimistic that if he was given a chance, he could find $8 million that he owed people. Hundreds of people were already racing to redeem their money when the Boston Post published an article by William McMasters, Ponzi's former publicity agent, entitled, Ponzi hopelessly insolvent. The article went on to claim that Ponzi was drowning in debt. He only has about $7 million at the most. He's taken in $15 million. If you've invested with Ponzi, you're going to lose it unless you get your money back. So McMaster's Ponzi's public relations man really wound up turning him in because McMaster said a public relations man first obligation is to the public he serves. On August 10, 1920, U.S. federal agents converged on Ponzi's securities exchange company and impounded everything in the offices. Ever the optimist, Ponzi kept his appointment to speak at the local Kiwanis Club that day. The theme of his talk was finance. On August 12, 1920, Ponzi met again with the officials who were investigating him. The authorities were there, his books were being examined, and Ponzi, graceful to the end, finally said to them, are you telling me, gentlemen, that I'm insolvent? And they replied, yes. And he said, in that case, I am your prisoner. And the business was over. The federal government indicted Charles Ponzi on 86 counts of fraud. The authorities also shut down the Hanover Trust Bank, where Ponzi had a controlling interest. It was interesting, when they went into the office to arrest him, the mob there virtually attacked the arresting agents. They were very upset. This was their hero. This man was inventing money for them. They all had visions of America providing them with their dream, which was to become wealthy. As it turned out, Ponzi never purchased any postal reply coupons. But nearly 17,000 investors had plunged more than $10 million into Ponzi's coffers within an eight-month period. At that time, he owed $15 million, but that was in 1920 terms. $10 million in 1920 might be worth a quarter of a billion today. I mean, $250 million. There were heartrending accounts of investors who stood to lose everything. A World War I veteran with tuberculosis 
had hoped to take his Ponzi earnings and recuperate in Arizona. One woman invested the $1,000 her family had received when her husband lost a leg in an industrial accident. One young couple had deposited $4,600 with the dream of using the profits to buy their first home. Holding a worthless Ponzi note, the bitter husband remarked, guess it's a doghouse for us now. Charles Ponzi went to trial in the fall of 1920. On November 1st, he pled guilty to a federal charge of using the mails to defraud and was sentenced to five years in prison. Ponzi's wife, Rose, fainted when the judgment was announced. Ponzi was sent to Plymouth Jail, where he sent letters to many of his investors, writing that he hoped the recent miscarriage of your investments would not mar the spirit of the Christmas season. Many investors wrote back to the man who had so happily taken their money. Some of it were absolutely scathing. You've stolen everything I had, calling probably every name in the book. Some were very consoling and sympathetic with him and admiring even, saying what a great man he was. And he even received money. <laughs> People would send money so that he could invest it when he got out. There were still believers out there. Ponzi served three and a half years and was released in 1924 to face a Massachusetts state trial. Ponzi was convicted and sentenced to a seven to nine year term. While out on bail pending his appeal, Ponzi went to Florida to raise money for his legal battles. He brazenly created the Charpon Land Syndicate Company while he was there. C-H-A-R-P-O-N. Charles Ponzi, and he sold land. The only problem with the land was most of it was underwater, and he was selling this to investors. The newspapers in Florida realized that he was the same Charles Ponzi who had pulled this big swindle. And he was indicted in Florida for fraud, and he skipped out and went to Texas. After a failed attempt to escape by ship, Ponzi was returned to Massachusetts to face his lengthy prison term. While befuddled government officials attempted to sort out his unconventional accounting methods. It took them years. And when they were finished, they had to admit that although they had determined that some significant sum of tens of millions of dollars must have passed through the scheme, they couldn't ever establish how much it was. In 1931, a bankruptcy court determined that the insolvent Ponzi still owed his remaining investors more than two million dollars. Many depositors received just pennies for every dollar they had so trustingly invested. Some wishful thinkers, believing that Ponzi would one day make them whole, held on to their SEC notes and received nothing. They were convinced that the whole thing was some kind of terrible mistake and he would get out of prison and he would give them back their money. To this day, I'm sure someplace in Boston homes, in an attic, there are old Ponzi certificates still waiting to be cashed in. They couldn't believe he wouldn't pay them. Ponzi walked out of prison for the last time in 1934. Crowds gathered around the once heralded financial genius, even though 14 years had passed since his scheme imploded. This mob was not a friendly mob. This mob was comprised of people that had lost their investment and still viewed him very much as a villain, someone who had ruined their lives and who had taken all their life savings. And in fact, in the crowd, there were a number of children, growing children of people who had invested with him. And these growing children were hostile towards Charles Ponzi because they felt that that had really decreased their opportunities in life as well. October 1934. America was in the midst of a debilitating national depression, created in part by reckless financial speculation and the collapse of the stock market. In Boston, Charles Ponzi had completed a lengthy prison sentence for swindling millions of dollars from several thousand victims during 1920. 
there was so much speculation by banks into a very hot stock market, which wound up collapsing in 1929. So in Ponzi's case, we really see a microcosm for what happens to the American economy in the 1920s. It was said that banks had been providing their um, investors everything except a roulette wheel. Just days after his release, Ponzi was deported to Italy, traveling in steerage class and leaving his faithful wife Rose behind. The once cocky immigrant seemed to be a shadow of his former self. In his final statement to reporters, Ponzi remarked, I went looking for trouble and I got it. Back in Italy, Ponzi reverted to his old self with a new twist to his financial trickery. Ponzi always had a plan for something that could turn things around. One of the schemes he came up with in his later years was writing his autobiography. He thought that if he could sell a thousand shares in his autobiography for $25 a piece, that would clear just about all of his debts. There were few takers, and the book project faded away. Finally, Ponzi settled on a legitimate job. He did have enough stature or enough self-confidence to make a bit of a position for himself with the Mussolini government in Italy. And within a relatively short period of time, they sent him to Rio de Janeiro to be an agent for the Italian state airline. Ponzi was set up in Rio with servants and a limousine. But this return to the high life would end, this time due to circumstances beyond his control. The authorities in Rio began to find out that diamonds and minerals from Rio were being sent out on this plane back to Italy because World War II was coming on. And these were strategic minerals that could be used by the Italians. So they cut off the fuel supply to the airline. Now Ponzi is now in Rio with no job because the airline is out of business. Charles Ponzi spent the last days of his life in the charity ward of a Rio hospital. He died in 1949 at the age of 67. And when he died, the only thing on his bedside table of any consequence was an unpublished manuscript entitled The Rise and Fall of Mr. Ponzi. At the time of his death, Ponzi's estate was valued at less than $100, just enough to pay for a pauper's funeral. Although its namesake passed away, the legacy of the Ponzi scheme lives on. A similar fraudulent money-making operation reared its head recently in a tiny foreign country. The entire government of Albania collapsed just two years ago because there were so many Ponzi schemes going on and so many government officials letting them go on because the government officials had invested their money in them. In 1993, a modern-day Ponzi named John G. Bennett created the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy. Bennett convinced numerous charities and nonprofit organizations to invest with his foundation, promising to double their money in six months with matching funds allegedly donated from a variety of wealthy benefactors. By the time Bennett's scam was uncovered, organizations including Harvard University, New York's Metropolitan Opera, and the Special Olympics lost more than $100 million. After Bennett was sentenced to 12 years in prison, he claimed that his desire to do God's work had made him delusional. Today, the Internet is a fertile home to thousands of get-rich-quick plans and sure-fire money-making schemes. And just about every single day, some willing participants are swindled. You may wonder, what moves a person to choose to invest? Uh, and the first thought, of course, is, well, there must be greed. 
But what moves these investors is actually something else. And at the very basis of it, I think, amazingly, is a fear of looking foolish. If I invest and it isn't legitimate, I'll lose my money. But if I pass this by and it is legitimate, I'm going to look like a fool. The Ponzi scheme has achieved a certain infamy in the world of finance. Some believe its namesake would be proud of that dubious achievement. He would love it. Ponzi would think that his legendary stature today is exactly what he deserves. Ponzi stands with Newton and with Einstein, with the great creators of history. His name is enshrined, and I'm sure that he would be delighted. When dreams of instant wealth cast their spell over the human psyche, characters like Charles Ponzi will always be lurking nearby, ready to separate people from their money. Whenever we go in search of history.